how our guidance has evolved <clears throat> over the years, and basically what we, what we have now, sort of the state of the art of, um, of numerical guidance to make a forecast. And I'm going to talk about how we use it and some of the problems we encounter in doing so, uh, and uh, very briefly some of the future, um, future challenges. And so um, here I'm, we're going to tr talk about um, what we forecast and then track intensity and tropical cyclone genesis forecasting and um, what the, uh, what's in store for the future. Uh, Bill Reed actually gave something like this. This again shows uh, what the parameters that we have been charged to forecast. Of course, beginning about seven years ago, we extended our forecasts out to, um, out to 120 hours. And uh, we predict track, intensity, size and structure, uh, genesis probabilities, likelihood of formation, storm surge, including inundation levels. Actually, there are time frames associated with these. I think Bill mentioned 36 to 48 hours. Rainfall and tornadoes actually via input from the Hydromet Prediction Center and the Storm Prediction Center. Um, I've got in red here, these bullets are the ones that I'd like to talk about because they're probably the ones that we, we think we can probably have uh, more success at in, in most cases. Track forecasting, uh, forecasting at the Hurricane Center entails um, several steps. First, the initial conditions, the initial motion, and its importance and how we determine it. The dynamical models, our subjective analysis, where we use up, we're able to use our forecaster skills, and the constraints we have, primarily that of continuity. The initial motion is very important. And in fact, for the first uh, 12 to 24 hours, this little study here showing the uh, sort of the um, hindsight ability of knowing the storm motion using the so-called best track climatology and persistence model. You could improve forecast from that model by as much as 43% over 12 hours, which could be crucial when a storm is close to the coast and for making the short-term forecast. So the accurate estimate, estimate of where the storm's going right now is very important. And that information also is used in some of the bogusing techniques to develop synthetic data in some of the models. And our 12-hour forecast is highly weighted by that initial motion estimate. And when you have systems with ill-defined centers, I can remember a storm back in 2001, Gabrielle, in the Gulf of Mexico, where the initial motion was so uncertain, we didn't know what, whether it was headed for the North Gulf Coast or the Northwest Gulf or for Florida. And in the end, it turned out it was headed for Florida. And we had to quickly um, uh, put up a warning for the West Coast of Florida when that initial motion became determined within a few hours. I know people are surprised to see this, but we actually still plot the hurricane on a map <laughs> with the fixes in red there, the aircraft fixes in blue and satellite fixes. And uh, the initial motion is typically computed by averaging over various periods, depending on um, whether the storm is fairly conservative, whether we don't know where the center is that well right now, or whether there are some we're pretty sure there's some short-term changes occurring. We don't usually want the initial motion to represent these little trochoidal wobbles that you see here. This is the track of Wilma, a very intense hurricane, and the eye is wobbling on this, along this kind of a path. And we wouldn't want to have the initial motion varying between west, almost just north of west to northwest, uh, over 6 to 12 hours. So again, we try to smooth that out. Our philosophy is also not to respond to short-term changes, but to wait till we're really sure before we indicate a significant change in, in heading or speed. The dynamical models often are, are really the reason why our forecasts have improved so much over the last couple of decades. And the um, consensus of the dynamical models, which we've been talking about quite a bit here, is often a very good first guess. And, some cases, perhaps we'd be better off just using it directly. As you can see, we're kind of chasing that consensus all the time. But with continuity, which is an important factor here for our own credibility, we need to consider the consensus forecast in view of the, pre the previous official forecast as well. And we try to use synoptic analysis, for example, uh, analyzing the steering factors in the environment, looking at water vapor imagery and try to evaluate what the important steering mechanisms are so that we can understand and and evaluate the model solutions that we're looking at, not just blindly follow the tracks. So we'll look at the evolution of the forecast fields from the models, the environmental fields, not just the, the tracks predicted by those models. We'll look at how well the, the tropical cyclone is initialized in the model fields, knowing that if we see what we think is an unrealistic structure, we'll probably 
not want to uh, take that forecast that seriously from that particular model. We'll sometimes consider whether um, one particular model is doing quite well during the life of a storm, both in terms of its accuracy and consistency. And finally, our confidence in the forecast, which is something that the, the decision makers really want to know, emergency management and so on, um, we can sometimes, uh, that can be dictated by the spread of the, uh, of the consensus itself. Here's an example where we have a weak tropical storm, but a tropical storm nonetheless, and the GFS fields show only a weak trough in this area. So this is an example of a bad initialization, and we wouldn't want to uh, look at, take the evolution of this too seriously because it doesn't really start out with a very realistic structure. Then the issue comes up is when we have a consensus and we have a lot of diversity in that consensus, in this case, a hurricane or, or a tropical storm, which is um, north of, just north of the Bahamas, and we're interested in where it's going to go here in, in 120 hours, and we've got uh, the UK Met Office off here to the west, the aviation model way out of here over the Atlantic, or the GFS, that is. The GFDL hurricane model over here, the no gaps down here. So we have this tremendous spread. And of course, uh, only one of these is going to be even close to correct in 120 hours. How do we resolve that difference? This is one example where we can try to make a selective consensus by looking at the initial structure of the storm, in this case, a weaker tropical storm, which does not have a lot of deep convection over the center and therefore is not likely to be steered by the deep layer flow. And if we look at the evolution of the steering winds in this case, we'd see the GFS was carrying this storm way out to the east by the upper level westerlies. And so in this case, we would largely disregard that solution and form what we call a selective consensus and um, at least be a little bit closer to, to the to the correct position. Now, the, that also will influence our track forecast. Um, if the track forecast, you know, depending on what kind of a track forecast we make, the intensity forecast it can influence that as well. So in this case, you, you were able to evaluate the model solutions and make some, you know, be able to exclude some of them, but it's not easy to do. And so many times, uh, we really don't have any obvious signs or reasons to disregard one particular model from our consensus. We have the uh, constraint of continuity as well. The previous for official forecast exerts a very strong constraint. Our credibility is often damaged if we make big changes from one forecast cycle to the next. Every six hours, we're issuing a new forecast. And we want, them to, we want those changes in the forecast to be gradual, not sudden, because in many cases, we may have to revert back to the previous forecast and have the so-called windshield wiper effect. We want to avoid that. Therefore, we make incremental changes to our forecast from one cycle to the next. And this is really uh, one of sort of meteorological um, aesthetics that to have the smooth changes in direction and speed over the 12-hour intervals. So here's an example from Dennis where our dynamical model guidance is shown in here. The official model is near the model, the consensus. It's hard to read from back there. But it's the, the consensus is somewhere here in the Florida Panhandle, as is the official forecast. And that's from 12Z on the 6th of the July, 6th of July. And then 18Z, the model consensus has shifted sharply westward. The official forecast does not go all the way over to the model consensus, which is located, I believe, somewhere in this vicinity here. And we do not shift it all the way over, but rather we we maintain continuity with the previous forecast and keep it now on the eastern edge of the guidance envelope, nudging it westward towards Alabama. Zero Z, 12 hours after that initial slide I showed you there, the, there hasn't been much change. One of our models, the no gaps has shifted eastward, but we're just standing pat still. We're still not believing in this shift. So we've really got about 12 hours worth of inertia. In this case, the continuity constraint really, I think, helped because the guidance shifted back to the east, and the official forecast and the consensus are pretty close to where they should be and the uh, actual landfall location. So had we followed consensus in this case, we would have been jumping over almost to New Orleans and then back, and that's not good for credibility, and it was also not realistic. We also look for consistency. In Hurricane Wilma, the GFDL was giving us a lot of uh, differing solutions, one showing recurvature, but not as fast as the this is at 0Z on the 19th, right around the time of maximum intensity of the hurricane. By 6Z, it was much faster up into New England. Then at 12Z, it says it's going to stay out in the Caribbean for five days. 
And then at 18Z, it's back up off the coast towards, um, towards Long Island. So clearly, we have some questions about the, the GFDL model and we're gonna be in this case. And in our discussion here, we indicated how the models have uh, backed off and the GFDL solution changed by a mere 1,650 nautical miles, as, as James had pointed out there. And, none, and obviously, the confidence in the track forecast, especially for the timing. And timing was an issue with Wilma. So it isn't just that cross-track error, it's also the timing. And that's, that's a problem that we'd have to contend with often. And this is an example from last year of Ida, where I don't think, we, I don't show all the models in the consensus, but the official forecast is right here, going along with most of the dynamical models close to the consensus, maybe a little bit slow at five days, where in reality at five days, the verifying position was up in the Gulf here. So again, uh, while long, oftentimes the timing is an issue, and that relates, of course, to the timing of the issuance of watches and warnings as well. In the case of Ida, it weakened and uh, became extratropical when it reached the coast, so it really wasn't that much of a problem. So anyway, for our operational intensity forecasts, we talk a little bit about the guidance models, about our subjective analysis and some of our general guidelines that we use to make an intensity forecast. Yes, okay. We have our statistical dynamical models, <clears throat> the uh, ships and LGEM. LGEM similar to the ships using a regression technique but it handles the predicted changes in the, uh, in the environment a little bit better. We have our high resolution hurricane models and when then we have the consensus of those above which James pointed out performs pretty well. The global models do help us some in making intensity forecasts because the forecaster can evaluate how the environment evolves in global models. And over the last decade or two, there's been tremendous improvements in prediction of tropical flow in the global models that has certainly helped us in making subjective forecasts, at least of intensity change. And we also have a statistical technique for forecasting rapid intensification. Uh, Bill showed a similar slide where, again, we, we often struggle with storms that intensify rapidly. Wilma, an example here back in 2005, pretty infamous example. We did have the RI index, which showed significant percentage of rapid probability of rapid intensification. The official forecast went above the ship's guidance here to about 100 knots. So we were calling for that 30 knot increase over 24 hours, but in reality, the storm, of course, intensified to 160 knots. These are the kind of cases we're gonna have a very hard time predicting. And as James had pointed out, these high resolution models can predict rapid intensification. It did in the case of Wilma, but it's, they're not reliable. They can predict the changes and sometimes they can over predict them. And here's an example of over prediction from Erica last year. I believe Naomi is gonna show more about this. Erica was a tropical storm that was badly sheared with a low level center located near Guadalupe here in the main convection here and presumably the upper level circulation off to the east. So the initialization of Erica, this is a cross section through uh, through the h -Wharf model at that same time of that satellite picture. And you can see how the vorticity pattern here is nearly vertical. And I'm sure, you know, I don't, I, we haven't done any model diagnostics or budget studies here to know how much that initialization is contributing to it maintaining a very strong storm and intensifying through three days. <clears throat> this series of, of, of intensity forecasts for Erica. To our credit, we never made Erica a hurricane, which is shown here in the red line. But the, um, the ship's guidance early on even had it becoming a hurricane, and the GFDL and HWRF predicted it to become a, uh, almost a Category 2 hurricane here. So we recognized that shearing environment. We recognized it as it was occurring and also as it was forecast in the, in the large-scale models, and so we largely ignored this. And I think the comment was made earlier. I said about the track having an influence, having the intensity forecast influencing the track, in this case, the bad intensity forecast also led to bad track forecast by the hurricane models the, because the, they were responding to the steering flow over the deeper layer of the troposphere and took it erroneously northward when it moved basically straight west in reality. So make a bad intensity forecast, you can make a bad track forecast. All right, I'm going to have to jump beyond our general rules here except to say that we, um, our forecasts tend to be conservative for intensity. Genesis forecasting, our best guidance for Genesis forecasting comes from the global models. The GFS and the European Center models seem to have the greatest skill, but we need more systematic verification. We use a lot of subjectivity. We have issues with Genesis forecasts in the Gulf of Mexico. Here's a, 
Forecast from Bill in the Eastern Atlantic, you can see he did a very good job. These are a series of forecasts all verifying at the same time, starting from about five days out. Then in the Gulf of Mexico, we had a difficult time predicting the genesis of Claudette. This is frequently the case in the Gulf. We don't pick up on genesis in these models very well at all. In the Eastern Pacific, we had some, we do have some success, but in the case of Rick, which was a very intense hurricane last year, there were significant errors in location and timing until only within about a day of the time of genesis. And this is a reliability diagram showing our percentage of probabilities of genesis compared to the observed percentages for individual systems that we mentioned in our tropical weather outlook. They're really good in the Atlantic. They're not quite as good in the Pacific. We tend to underpredict the formation, but they're good enough so that we, t we intend to go to explicit probabilistic numbers in the tropical weather outlook. So now we'll say there is a 60% probability of tropical cyclone formation, whereas before we were saying low, medium, and high. So in the future, the challenges are to extend that, potentially extend track and maybe even intensity forecast out to seven days. Uh, my contention is that if we're going to do this, we're probably going to have to move to this as well is to indicate track and intensity forecasts for tropical cyclones that have, do not yet exist. Uh, we're going to have to extend our structure forecasts. We're going to extend our genesis forecasts out to five days. We're already doing that experimentally. The success is mixed. Uh, <laughs> And uh, probably provide more detailed information about impacts, waves at the coast, additional uh, rainfall and uh, tornado information. And we'll need some help there from the um, mesoscale models. Okay, that's it. Thank you.